welcome, welcome to Wishaw Old Parish Church for all of us who are here in person and for those of you who are watching online later. Well, I think I've run out of things to say, haven't I? Three Sundays to go for me. We come here to worship God. We come here with a sense of joy and peace and we look forward to receiving the grace of God during our service today. Let's just relax, contemplate, reflect, just have a moment of quiet as we prepare ourselves for our worship this morning. God calls us to worship today through the words of the Apostle Paul. And as for you, my friends, you are called to be free. But do not let this freedom become an excuse for letting your physical desires control you. Instead, let love make you serve one another. For the whole law is summed up in one commandment. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Let's join in singing our first hymn of praise today, Hymn 600, Spirit of God. We need your power, we need your strength, following Christ each day. Let's join our hearts and minds in prayer today as we seek the power and the strength of our Lord. Lord, you bring us here each week. We join as being part of the worldwide family of the faith. Let's think of those in distant lands worshipping today in churches large and small. For each one of us is part of your body, the body of Christ, which we call your church. For we are a congregation, an assembly of believers and worshippers to come and serve and learn about their Lord. 
holy God, divine being, creator of heaven and earth. These are grand titles. But you who are our friend, our helper, our inspiration and comforter, may your presence be with us today and each day as we walk with you. For in the form of the Holy Spirit, as part of you, you are that creative spirit of love which lives next to our hearts and our very souls. Lord, may we offer you the love of our hearts, the words of our thoughts, the actions of our bodies, to be this your servant in the world, to become the disciples who follow in the ways of Jesus, to be today's apostles who live and share in the world the gospel of good news. Forgive us, Lord, when we let the ways of the world block the goodness of thy love. Prevent us expressing the compassion of thy kindness and de-energize us as we work for the kingdom. Living God, help us when we are unable to understand the tests and the challenges, the times and the troubles that make it hard to follow our faith. Be the light that keeps us on the pathway. <coughs> Be that light to becoming the Christian follower as we offer a helping hand to others. We remember people who are low. and We have an awareness of living, behaving, and speaking in a manner worthy of you. We do so, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, who teaches us in the Lord's Prayer to say together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. There are some times in the life of, of a preacher when you just can't think of anything to say and you rack your brains, you look at all your books, you go over old things and gosh, I've, I've done that one before, I've told that one before. So what do we need to keep the faith alive? We need a good story, don't we? And I thought I would try something completely different today. Because I'm not going to tell the story. You are. I'm glad somebody's laughing because this could go badly wrong. Okay. So all stories begin once upon a time. Who do we need in a story to start off with? Nothing? Yes, Caitlin. We need characters, that's right. So I brought my two characters. I brought Janet and John with me. Here we go. So we'll have them as our characters. And so what next do you need in a story? Once you've got your two characters, we've got a male and a female character, what do you need? Sorry, a plot. Right, so the plot's in here. Okay, the famous plastic bag, all ministers or, or, oh gosh, all other stores are available, <laughs> right? You just grab the first one that you can. So anyway, so sometimes you need something to get you going on a plot. Now, this is a religious story, so I'm going to throw this to you, Caitlin, and whatever one comes up, we're just going to take a wee bit of chance here, so just read it out. Which one's come up?
So what came up was we need a story about the cross. Okay? So Janet and John are following the way to the cross. How are they going to follow the way to the cross? Walking, that's right. So anyway, I've got here... Uh, I'm not priming you in any way, am I? No, I'm not priming you. So anyway, you've got to have good insoles. You've got to have really good insoles. So Janet and John are going to walk the way to the cross with really good insoles on their, their feet. And it, it's a journey. A good, a good story is really, it's really a journey. And on the way... Well, what happens on the journey? Let's, let's get Caitlin to help us here. What happens on the journey of life, Caitlin? We'll just leave that one up there in the meantime. So, what happens on the journey of life? Janet and John pick it, pick out, and we'll make this story. Well, it's a religious story, so she's picked out the Bible. Isn't that amazing? Goodness me. So, as you walk along life, Janet and John, you're going to need the Bible to find the cross. If we don't have our Bibles, you're unlikely to find the cross. You know, you might, but you're really unlikely to find the cross. What's going to happen next in our story? Well, where's the story taking place, Caitlin? Scotland. Thank you, Doris. Yes, that's right. Now, this story is taking place in Scotland, and really, you'd be very foolish to go... <laughs> For a story in Scotland without your umbrella. I'm not saying you're going to use it, because as we know, it's a very sunny country. One day a year, okay? What else have we got in here, Caitlin? So the story to the cross by Janet and John. Oh my goodness, what have you chosen? Squeeze it. <whistles> Who comes with you on the story of life? Whose do you think that, that this is? That's, that, that's a dog. I've just got a new, a new puppy. That's right. And this is a puppy's favourite toy. I couldn't bring the puppy with me today. So it would have been really, um, it, it would have been far, far too much. So on the journey of life, we need to take our companions with us. And I'm, I'm taking my new puppy with me. Who else have we got, Caitlin? We've got... Smiley face, that's right. There are going to be happy times. In life, there is going to be some happy times. But let's just see what else is in here. Oh, what's this? Badminton. Yes, there's going to be some fun times. We're going to have some games in life. Yeah, life shouldn't be, it shouldn't be all serious. Some, sometimes we've got to... We've, we've, We've got to play our games. What else is there in here? Take that one. Okay, that one's fine. Yes. What's this? It's a flask. And what's usually inside the flask? <laughs> oh, thank goodness for that. <laughs> Sometimes we need a wee bit of the spirit to help us along the road. Is that right, Thomas? Yes. Uh, that could possibly. I'll expect that to be filled by the end. Right, let's see. Here we go, Caitlin. Here we go. Choose that one. What's that one? It's a bill, isn't it? We're going to have to pay for a lot of things in life. So even on the way to the cross, as we're walking on a really good, there's going to be happiness, our companions, the Bible's with us, there's fun. Okay, it might rain. What's, what's this one? It's a rock, it's a stone. And the stone represents all the things that we have to carry. That's just life, isn't it? You'll have to carry these stones on your back throughout your life. Yes, there are happy times on the way to the cross. Yes, the companions are there. But sometimes the story isn't. And here's, here's the last one. What's this one? pens and paper. That's, that's all the work that I've had to do throughout the last 40 years of my ministry. 
I'll not tell you what the choir just said. <laughs> there's people laughing, there's people crying, there's people, there's lots of things. So here we have, so we've got our story, we've got our characters, we're on the way to the cross, we've got all these different companions and things that we have to, to take with us. But what's missing? What's missing in this religious story to the cross? The most obvious answer that there ever is. Who's missing? Jesus. Jesus is there no matter what our story is. Jesus is with us, walking throughout our lives, on our story. And maybe at times when we haven't got anything to say, Maybe at times when we've got those stones to carry. Maybe it's the happy times. But Jesus is with us all along the story of life. Let's join. I'm looking up here for the hymn, even when the telly gets bust. And we're going to sing, I am a new creation. Continue our look at the book of Galatians, uh, and Mary will read from us from chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, reading from verse 16. What I say is this, let the Spirit direct your lives, and you will not satisfy the desires of the human nature. For what our human nature wants is opposed to what the Spirit wants, and what the Spirit wants is opposed to what our human nature wants. These two are enemies, and this means that you cannot do what you want to do. If the Spirit leads you, then you are not subject to the law. What human nature does is quite plain. 
It shows itself in immoral, filthy and indecent actions, in worship of idols and witchcraft. People become enemies and they fight. They become jealous, angry and ambitious. They separate into parties and groups. They are envious, get drunk, have orgies and do other things like these. I warn you now as I have before, those who do these things will not possess the kingdom of God. But the Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. There is no law against such things as these, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have put to death their human nature with all its passions and desires. The Spirit has given us life. He must also control our lives. We must not be proud or irritate one another or be jealous of one another. Amen. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you, Mary. And now we join in singing for your gift of God the Spirit. If I keep looking behind me, that's because I can't see which slide's on the screen there, so I do apologize today. Now may the words of my heart and the meditations of, of my mind be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Amen. There is a, a new biopic on television about Mozart, those of you who like classical music. Uh, Mozart, the the child genius who never quite escaped the fame throughout his life. And it's true that many talented and skillful people, which sets them apart from the norms of, a, of us all, somehow their talent imprisons them, prevents them from being happy and fulfilled. We, life, 
fate them. We offer them applause, give them riches, adoration, admiration. But somehow their life is not satisfied and they become imprisoned in their faith. Which one's that? Okay, that's the right one. I've also been watching the uh, series about the life of President Zelensky. A man who had ambitions as a, as a child to become a, a comedian, an entertainer. And then he played a politician in a fictional TV series. He then took on the mantle of being a real politician in a corrupt state. The people projected the reality that they wanted from their politicians. They wanted an honest, they wanted an upright, upfront man with values and desires. Now, he's a very small man. He's somewhat comical on the world stage. He started his life uh, as a comic. And therefore, naturally, the other world leaders would think, it's a bit of a pushover, that man. And we all know what happened. He was capitulated, catapulted into becoming a world leader. A world leader whose aim in life is freedom. Freedom for his people, freedom for his nation, and freedom for their very identity. Two figures in life, one imprisoned, one of the most talented musicians the world has ever, ever seen or heard, and another man who was catapulted into reality to bring freedom. And so what comes into my mind often as I think of these, of these ideas are songs. And a very famous song by, again, a musical genius, Freddie Mercury. A deeply flawed and troubled man throughout his life, who sadly died of, of AIDS in very tragic circumstances. And yet, that song, I Want to Break Free, came into my mind. And we used to have a video of Queen's greatest hits. And one of my loveliest memories as a father was seeing my two little girls, who are now two young women, so well over 20 years ago. And we used to put on this silly video, and they would dance around to Freddie singing, I want to break free. A lovely memory, but there's a serious side to it. And so that's the, the lead-in to this part of the book of Galatians. Some scholars have called it Paul's gospel. He wants the people to break free. There was a tension within the Christian church. And he doesn't want them to return to being slaves. Either slaves of the mind or literal slaves. Some of the Galatians, before they had become Christians, had followed what was known as Anti-nominism. And anti-nominism is basically a belief that you can be a religious and spiritual person and that's separate from your human behavior. So you can go to the temple, go to the synagogue, go to the church, and you can seem religious, but when you go outside in the world, you don't need to bother about that. And you can see the tension within, within that. And that's a tension that is true for us today. And so Paul wants his Christians, his young Christian church, to be real Christians. And that's the, the point of tension of the whole of the book of Galatians. is about this desire that Paul has for us to be free. Not to be tied to the Judaism of the past. Not to be tied to the antinomianism or, or the worship of the spirits of the past. But to be free to become, to follow that path to the cross. And so in chapter 4, I'll just give you a wee bit of the context of this. 
chapter 4, he uses a story. And it'd be a story that the Jewish Christians would have known and the Gentile Christians would have known because it's a story relating of two women, Haggai and Sarah. And it comes from Genesis chapter 3. If you want to read their story and goes on to chapter 22. And these two women became the symbols of slavery versus freedom. Abraham, the father of the nation, Abraham, dating back to the identity of these people, he had two sons. One by a slave woman, the other by a free woman. And he draws the distinction in the story, as Paul's telling it, that one was by natural birth, that was the, the slave woman, and the other was by promise of God, that was the free woman. And so the story illustrates for the Galatians, it's a tale of rebirth. It's a tale of conversion. It's a tale that you are inheritors of the past. In the story of Haggai and Sarah, the rebirth of the people of Israel by God's Spirit. There was a conversion that meant there was a new ethnicity, and finally there was freedom to be free. So that's, that was the purpose of that story. And so we come to, to chapter 5. And chapter 5 begins with these, with these words. Freedom is what we have. Christ has set us free. Stand then as free people. Do not allow yourself to become slaves again. Oh, you put that up. Oh, no. no, no that's the next slide. Sorry. Okay. Next slide. We live in an age of, of freedom. We have a great deal of, of freedom. And there's a constant tension in the freedom of choice. Whether it's the right to die debate, that's coming up before Parliament very, very soon. There's been a, a constant debate in the Scottish Parliament. The right to choose your own gender. Those of us of an older generation, those of us of a religious persuasion, find that a very, very hard debate to get our heads around. There's the right of us all to eat, to smoke, and to drink versus the cost of our health. There's the right to be anonymous online and say things, positive and negative, about people in the public eye. All these topics are big topics. They push us in our choices one way, they push us in our choices another way. They put us into a camp. Do you agree with that side? Do you not agree with that side? They make us uncomfortable when we have a viewpoint and the people we're talking to disagree with our viewpoint. Most people here are Presbyterians. And the one thing about Presbyterians is we're all bullshit. We're all free we all don't like someone telling us what to think. We defend the freedom of our religious faith. Now many sermons will come down on one side or other of these big social issues. But how are we to judge these social issues for ourselves? And this is the whole point of the book of Galatians. How are we to be free to answer these particular situations in our society, which any society has these big issues. And so Paul's answer is very, very plain. We are being led by the Spirit of God within us. Led by the Spirit of God. For this, the Spirit is the free agent. For the Spirit shapes the very qualities of our character. We spoke in our sermon last week about recapturing the church's intergenerational DNA. That just basically means having a church full of children, young people, growing people, middle-aged people, and, and older people. 
It doesn't happen overnight. The DNA is the classic nature versus nurture debate. And yet being in a Christian environment, then some of Christianity will rub off on us. We know that a child is not going to remember the beliefs and the doctrines of the Christian faith. That's why we use humor and we use visual images. But if a young person mixes and mingles, then some of the Christian character that we have rubs off on them. There are many people within the church say, well, what's the point of having all these organizations within the church, whether it's Boys Brigade or Girls Brigade or Guild or, you know, different organizations. If we don't experience life with one another, if we don't experience the story with one another, we need to play together. We need to socialize together. We need to care for one another. We need the basic human needs of company and activity. And so what lies beneath the church, whether it's gathering and worship, whether it's all the organizations, whether it's all the structures and systems of the church, is the Spirit of God. And this Spirit is manifested in the tensions that come out in chapter 5, where Paul says to us, you're going to get taken over by your human desires and your passions. And there's a whole list of human desires and passions from immorality to filth to jealousy to anger. It goes through a whole list of the parts of humanity that we have. They're part of us whether we like it or not. And so Paul says, are you being drawn by those Or are you being drawn by the Spirit? And Paul wants his Christians to have what we knew in the old days as an upright moral character. He wishes to foster this in his young church. He sees that will be the church represented in the world, full of people with an upright moral character. And so how do we get those spirits And so he gives us that list of things that we don't want. And then he gives us the list of things that we do want. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. These are all known as the fruits of the Spirit. And so Paul says to us really bluntly, it's it's a, a very seminal passage within Scripture, if you go down the road of being controlled by human desires, this will lead to ruination. But if you go down the road led by the spirit of love, and the spirit of love is the cause of all the other fruits of the spirit. In Latin, it's sin quod non. It is the cause. The others don't happen unless we have that love within us. We have love. And then we have joy and peace. And Paul mentions this word joy over 40 times in his letters. Often Christianity gets a bad rap as being slightly negative. Paul wants us to have the joy of life. But he knows that life is not always great. So he wants us to have peace. And there's no one definition of peace. It's, It's not war. It's not fighting. It's not anxiety. It is peace within and peace without. And then the the qualities of the personality. I wish I had all these. But if you meet someone who's patient, kind, good, someone who's faithful, someone who's humble, and someone who is in control, then you think to yourself, that person is guided by the Spirit. The older translations use the term walk by the Spirit. So what did Paul mean by this? Well, to walk, 
The word in, in Greek means to go. It's the movement. It's, but it's also how we should conduct ourselves in our lives. So as we reflect on someone like Mozart, who we admire and revere, and yet when you examine Mozart's life, it was deeply flawed. Because he was exalted in one particular quality of life, and the whole part of life just wasn't there. Do you think of President Zelensky? What strikes you in the film, the three parts of the film that I've seen, is how humble he is. He's really struggling with this real person. With this re he wasn't a natural politician. He doesn't seem to want to have power after the war is over. He just wants to have freedom for his country. In the Old Testament, they believed that the Jewish law, the Jewish Torah, the commandments as we know them, the Ten Commandments, were the qualities that lay on God's heart. Ezekiel in the Old Testament promises that God will walk, that God's people will walk in his commandments when he puts his spirit in them. And they believed that God's spirit was breathed into us, bruach, roach. <coughs> Paul said to this young church, I want you to be real Christians. I want you to have a DNA and an ethic which is worthy of Christ. We can choose to go down a, a different road and be susceptible to sin, hence the, the list of desires that lead to ruin. But Paul takes this Old Testament notion of God breathing life, God breathing his spirit into the people to give them a new heart. And he sees that in the fulfillment of Jesus. And so we come, as it says, as God's, part of God's living son, not only walking, but being guided by the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Amen. May God bless to us. The book of Galatians, chapter 5. Thank you. I'm going to in invite Tom now to lead us in our thanksgiving and intercessory prayer. <coughs> Let's come together in prayer. Lord, you have created a world full of people, a universe full of planets and stars, a world of richness and variety that we all share and enjoy. You sent us your son Jesus to show us how to live in our world. May we have the grace to follow him. Loving God, we are sorry when we have wandered far from you, when we have not listened to your voice and listened instead to other voices, the voices of greed and selfishness. You have offered us abundance of life, but we have settled for so much less. 
forgive us and offer us assurance of your pardon. In Jesus, we have been forgiven, so let us live as one who is forgiven. In the name of Christ, our Lord and Master. We remember and pray this day for the innocents caught up in the wars in Ukraine and Gaza, the hungry and starving who daily struggle to find food in a world of plenty, those who have to walk a mile for a source of clean water, for those immigrants fleeing Tinry in their native land and seeking refuge and safety in Europe and yet risking crossing seas for that same refuge. Through our prayers, may they be comforted. Loving and forgiving God, help and encourage political leaders around the world to continue to find solutions to the world's problems rather than resort to war. Guide the wealthy nations to provide the necessary aid to countries suffering from the effects of famine and drought. We offer our prayers today for our members absent from worship for whatever reason. Be beside those who are anxious and depressed. Comfort those who are ill and bring them healing in due time. Surround the dying and all who have lost loved ones with your everlasting arms. <coughs> May they all feel your love this week as we face the future renewed and encouraged by your spirit. Amen. <coughs> Now our offering shall be received. ask God's blessing upon these gifts. Lord God, we adore thee. Come to worship and lay our lives before thee, giving thanks and praise for our life and faith in Jesus. Let us love thee and our neighbor, and by hearing thy word, grow in faith as we offer ourselves unto thee. Lord, accept these gifts in order that your spirit may rest within our hearts today and always. Amen. Good morning, friends, and welcome as always to our service, and a special welcome to any visitors sharing time with us this morning, whether they're here in church or watching online. For those that are here, please take time to share in that wider fellowship in the hall following the service. As always, our thanks go to Keith for his conduct of worship and that reminder that the Holy Spirit guides our life journey. Also to Mark for leading our worship at the organ and for his support during this past three weeks or four weeks so while May has been in holiday. To Mary for her reading, to May Hawthorne for the preparation of the PowerPoint uh, and to Neil who's flying solo today over at the recording desk for his work in the recording and the later upload today. I'm delighted to report to you that Betty Gray is recovering well after treatment at home. However, Rena Boyd, who was discharged from hospital on Wednesday, was readmitted on Thursday. Uh, and she's still there, but she, she, we believe she is improving. Uh, and, and Walter Gray, uh, his turntable in June, June is now his nursemaid because she's in bed with a clue. Our prayers, as always, for a speedy recovery to anyone who's ill. And remember, as always, stay safe, stay calm, stay praying, and God bless you all. Uh, following the pattern of last week, uh, there was a further meeting of the subcluster uh, dealing with the implementation plan, and it is our agreed policy 
that after every meeting there will be a statement read to each congregation in the cluster to make you aware of what is going on and also to dispel the rumour mongers, the soothsayers and conjecturists uh, in the town who hear a small snippet of information and turn it into something completely different. There is a copy of this statement and indeed last statement, last week's statement at the rear of the church if you want to take it home uh, and read it please uh, and form a library. But to the report on the meeting that was held here last week, it was confirmed that the churches would remain open until sold and that some church activity must take place regularly to comply with insurance and other logistical matters. The Church of Scotland draft template will be used as a guide through the subcluster to guide our discussions and decision making. That's available on the church's website if you want to have a look at it. A small number of possible names were elicited from harmonious and constructive discussion which took place. It was agreed to revisit this issue and that further consideration would be given to the matter before any particular name would be put before the three congregations. So the congregation will have to vote on the final name. The charity number will be determined by presbytery as the existing charge with the highest reported cash and investment balances, and that, as a matter of record, will be wish it old. So we will retain our charity number, but obviously the name of the church will change. As far as Mance is concerned, it's been agreed, subject to the approval of the respective church sessions, the Presbytery of Fort Valley and Clydesdale and the General Trustees, to sell the Manses of Cambusneth and Old in Morningside and St Mark's, with Wisher Old Mans being retained at this time. The free proceeds from such sale will be held in the Consolidated Fabric Fund for the new United Congregation, and we will seek the input and cooperation of the general trustees and the church as regards the procedure and processes. There was some debate on the size of the Kirk session. It was unanimously and unequivocally agreed that the number of trustees from each existing congregation be equal in number in a new union and that all elders being pastoral in capacity. No elder will be debarred from any Kirk session meeting if they wish to attend. But on an administrative note, subject to the approval of the Kirk sessions, the number of trustee elders in the union will be 21, with a total of seven coming from each congregation. Each Kirk session should determine the strategy and methodology to arrive at this said number in due course. Thank you for your patience again, but a reminder, copy is available at the rear of the church. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Well, obviously, you'll see that uh, much work is, is being done uh, over the next uh, few weeks to bring matters forward. You may have seen that I'm looking rather gaunt. That's because I'm going round the whole presbytery explaining what Tom has just uh, said to you over the next uh, few weeks. So bear with me, I'll be a shadow of myself next, 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 next Sunday. But what is really nice is that the whole church is in this together, that the, the warmth and the grace is coming through. That even though, let's face it, people don't want it to happen, but people know that it has to happen, that it will happen, and are walking in faith. They're walking with the Spirit. So we hope that everybody can feel that and feel that everybody in the Church of Scotland is together in this challenge. Yeah. Uh, there will be a very, very brief uh, Kirk Session meeting after the service on the chancel. We close our service today with 513. Courage, brother, do not stumble. <coughs>
now in joy, in peace, and in love. And we ask for the blessing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.